appreciate it and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I haven't done a webinar in a while, so kind of fun actually. I've kind of not done one for quite a while. Um, the purpose of today is really to talk about artistry and technology and how that really works for our restorative future. And I think we, we sometimes forget or, or jump the gun a little bit in the sense that artistry is, is to me is still the most critical aspect of what we do. And although we talk about product and process so often and the technology that helps us, I think we forget there's an artistic component. So I'd like to kind of walk through that a little bit in our short time together and basically explain to you how we approach that here in my office and, and how I think the future is gonna benefit you to have those elements in your offices and your practices. One of the challenges that we face all the time is what I like to call is the human element. And we do get so bogged down in product and process that we forget that everything that we do is for a person. It's for a mother, a brother, a father, a sister. It's for somebody close to somebody. And I think it's very important for us to realize that we should address each restoration that way and not only look at it as how quick or how fast we can actually make that happen. Although that's part of the game and I, and I truly understand that. So the goal here is to figure out how to combine these two objects together. And that's what we'll kind of work through a little bit in our time together. For me, I look at every patient the same. I wanna look at the face. I wanna look at where the white stuff is and I wanna look at where the pink stuff is. And once I have those three elements, then I also have to take into consideration who the person is. And the person part is kind of important because let's be realistic. I think we've all worked with some patients that might be a little bit on the crazy side. And we've worked with some patients who are really nice and easygoing. And that's part of our job to understand the situation. Could it be financial constraints? Could it be aesthetic challenges? Um, could it be a combination of both? Could it be a manual dexterity thing when we're talking about uh, fixed detachables or, or things that patients have to be hygienic and cleansable with. So our job is to take all of those things into account about that human, put it back into their face white and pink, and basically come up with a concept of how to, how to work best in that environment. I would tell you that I think today's technician needs to be a lot different than the technician of five, 10 years ago. We actually need to be more like the technicians of 20, 30 years ago. And I know that sounds kind of crazy to say, but the truth of it is, I think we learned to be better technicians back then. We learned in the sense of being more complete in what we do. We weren't necessarily, let's say a piece worker type where we learned one specific thing and we worked through that thing quite often. So really the goal became to know as much as physically possible as we can. Um, in today's technicians, you need to really look more through the process. And you'll notice on my screen to the left of your screen that I'm looking at the face. I'm looking at where the eyes are, the plane and the lips and all the things that go, that add into that human face. Um, we used to only have to worry about aesthetics as ceramics, right? How much pounding powders do we use? How pretty can we make the inside of edge? But then we realized none of that really worked if we didn't functionally work through the case and understand that it's a functional challenge of the case. And then the, the third component of that is actually putting it all together. So what I'm really looking for our teams and our technicians to be today is more of a dietitian, uh, a di diagnostic tician, I should say, um, in the sense of, I want you to have a diagnostic opinion. I want you to really be able to look at a case and work your way through the entire case and understand what's good and bad for that patient. Let's be clear, the technology today is amazing and some of it is better than others for different reasons, which we will kind of touch on a little today. But remember, in the end, it's the people that are operating the technology. And if you weren't, if you didn't have a sense of morphology, shape and form and face white and pink before, I don't think the computer aids in that for you. I think you actually still need to understand those basics. And the example I always use is that of an architect. Uh, a serious architect learns to sit down and draw on a drafting board before they go to the computer program, because that's a skill that gives them perception of where things belong. So I wanna make sure that we understand that that's very critical. Our future is simple. You need a diagnostic opinion. I want you to be able to manage the risks of your cases and be clear, every case you take on has risk. What that risk may be is different for every case. It could be about the patient. It could be something as simple as color. It could be about the final aesthetics or it could be about the material of choices. 
But the more options you have, the bigger your toolbox is, the easier your life becomes. So when I look at a patient like this patient, his name is Adam. I want to be able to take all what I see with this patient and transform that into a diagnostic opinion for Adam. One of the things we've incorporated here in my lab, and I've kind of been showing this for the last year or two, is to stop looking at the patients as just a set of casts or models that are in a box or a pan in your office. So what we've started doing is adding, taking these pans or boxes and actually taking the patient's face and attaching it to the pan. And I think this is important for every aspect of throughout your laboratory in the sense that I want, whether it's the shipping and receiving or model and die or billing or whoever it is to see that case, when they put their hands on it, they're looking at who the human is and not just working on getting a molar out the door as fast as possible. The other aspect of this is now you have to have a diagnostic opinion of how to evaluate what you see for this patient. So in a case like this for Adam, you can see obviously he has a single central that's a challenge for us. But also if, you, if you've if you noticed, um, the lateral is not the lateral. So where the number 10 would be is actually a cuspid. And this changes the whole game or whole parameters of what we're doing in the sense that we now need to figure out how to create teeth and forms that look right for his face. So I have to have a diagnostic opinion. I have to be able to do some sort of an aesthetic evaluation. And then I have to be able to think through materials. What material works best for this scenario? And you can see that I have several different amounts of space to fill. And this really presents a pretty huge challenge for us as technicians today. And I think this is where what I see as I'm teaching around the world these days that this is where I'm seeing the most challenge. Um, which material, which one works best, which one fills this space or fills that space. So if we take a look at the spacing that I'm talking about, you can see I have a lot of space on one tooth and then very little space on other teeth. Is this a zirconia case? Should this be an all ceramic case? Should it be a metal ceramic case? What, what's the right case for this? And I could tell you that for me, I'm probably gonna spend the most time on a case like this, managing the bigger space, not the smaller space. So I'd spend more time managing the space on that central than I would on anything else, because that's the bigger challenge for me at that point. And in the end, our goal is to deliver something aesthetic for that patient, but, I think our flaw is we all tend to do the same thing. Most of you right now are staring at a picture of teeth. I'm looking at the patient, I'm looking at his face and I'm looking at his eyes. And in the end, that's to me what really matters. Can we make them feel different? Can we improve how they eat and how they smile and how they appear? And if we could achieve those things, then we are valuable. I think our, our us as technicians become more valuable as, as this industry goes forward and technology keeps evolving that's gonna help us in this process. So again, for me, it's always about the face and the eyes never lie to you. If you really look at the patient's eyes before and after, you can always tell if you satisfy their needs. So I said that this is about people for me. It's also about technology and artists, but I wanna kind of not lose sight of there are good products and processes that help us along the way. For me, the goal is always to think of the end result with the patient more than just the product and process. But I also don't want to sound like I'm anti-technology because I'm not. Uh, I may define technology a little bit different than a lot of people. To me, technology starts from shape taking devices to my camera, which I think is probably one of the things I use the most in my practice today, um, to the equipment that I use or down to my brush and the ceramics that I use. Every one of those things is parts of technology for me. And I need to be versed with all of them. I don't wanna have one of them that just is the one that I count on. They're all important parts. But I could tell you out of all of these that you see here, that camera is probably the one that I find most critical today. Uh, and that's why I'm teaching probably more photography courses and things today than ever before. When we get onto the artistry side, our, our goal becomes really challenging because uh, you know not all of us are artists. I know I'm not, and I work really hard to try to understand morphology and shape and form. And that study of that, I think, becomes so critical for us. Being able to look at teeth and understand all their nuances, the topography of the surface, how the incisal edge bends or twists, how the embrasure spaces work from tooth to tooth, or how the papilla changes from tooth to tooth, how the gum tissue sits, and all those little details of what makes teeth look real. And our goal is to take that artistry 
and utilize the technology in that process to help us get to that final result. So I want them to look as real as possible. And by the way, not all your patients want that, right? So you have to always be kind of aware of that. I can't tell you how many patients I've seen that, you know, they see a case that I'm working on on my desk and their first result, the first comment is, can you make them smoother? Can we not have some of the texture or, or some of the other things that go along with that? And that's because that's their version of aesthetic. So our job is to really manage that situation. I think where this becomes the most challenging for us, especially with all the materials that we're working through today, is really when it comes down to a single central cases. Um, for me, these are always, and I think for all of us, are, are, are the biggest challenge. But they're not just the biggest challenge aesthetically. They're also a huge challenge in the sense of which material is right. So I think most of the companies today are kind of very, um, they, ha they have a large spectrum of materials to use. And I think that's important for us. But also, I think it's really important to understand that we need to know which one is right for us. Because let's be realistic. It's not the company's job to tell you which material is right for which case. It's their job to create materials and options for you to use. So when you look at a case like this with a single central, a fairly darker crepe shade, you have to know, do I want a translucent zirconia here? Because I know that seems to be the rage right now, right? Everywhere I go, all I'm hearing is about how translucent everybody's zirconia is. And there is a need for that. But when is the need? When do you want that to be? And, and when do you not want it to be? Because there are times you have to really be able to think through, do I want a color substructure? Do I want an opacified substructure? Do I want a translucent substructure? Or do I want a little bit of all of those aspects? And that becomes your job. So again, I don't ever want to sound anti anything. I love translucent materials. I think they're great for us. And I like that I can get more and more light transmission. But in the end, I have to be able to either use enough materials to make that um, opacify to look like nature, or maybe I'm just using the translucent materials for more monolithic restorations, which is fine, but I need to know when, where, and why. So I think we have so many materials to look through today, and I think that's wonderful. Um, I'm excited about that, but let's be clear. Each one of these materials means you, means you need to know how to use it. When does it apply, and why does it apply to the restoration you're trying to work through? And I don't want to go through every material because we don't really have time for that today. But I want to know, do I want to do something monolithic? And this is a monolithic nano hybrid. This is not actually zirconia. This is a, an enamic type material. So I have no problem doing a monolithic molar, um, either in a lithium silicate or um, uh, a zirconia or something softer, which would be more like a um, nano hybrid type material. They all work. But your job is to understand when, where, and why. Do I want a harder material? Do I want something like zirconia or do I want a pure ceramic? So it's another option for me. So I have many options that I can use and obviously having the, the systematic approach in my software to be able to approach all of those is kind of the key for me. And let's be clear, I think I'm leaving tomorrow or the day after for Arizona for a digital denture symposium. Even in this world today, the digital process is taking effect. So how many things can we do where we can actually scan, transfer the information, not have to use impression material in the patient's mouth, and then be able to actually use all the same processes to mill a denture base or try and maybe uh, go back to some denture teeth and cement them in place, and then actually create almost a, a, a fully processed digital denture which is pretty amazing. So all these things are fabulous. But in the end, our job is to know when, where, and why. And for me, I think our focus for, for this afternoon is really about zirconia, since that's kind of what I probably do most these days. When we're talking about zirconia, and I, wanna, I left metal ceramic there and lithium silicate and, and other materials, because we use them all. I, I still do a lot of metal ceramic, but I choose it for the right case. Same way with lithium to silicate and, and other ceramic materials. Um, but with, with all of them, I do need a few um, very didactic approaches. For one, I have to understand ceramic support on all of them. I need to understand the connector sizes. Are these going to be splinted cases and how much space do I have between the tissue and emergence and where the incisal edge is? I also need to understand the connector positions, if they're facial or lingual um, or, or you know, more towards the incisal and more towards the cervical. 
I need to understand their path. Are the teeth parallel enough for me to be able to do what we need to do? And then again, opacity. Do I need a more opacified restoration or a more translucent restoration? So all of these come into play. We're gonna to touch a little bit on the basic substructure design in a few minutes. Um, before that, I to finish up our single central case, I just wanted to kind of touch on the importance of fluorescence. So let me be really clear. The zirconias today and the lithium silicates today that we're using do not have natural fluorescence to them. We will get there and we're getting there kind of quickly. So I think we'll see a lot of those improvements in the next year or two. Um, but at this moment, they do not have that. And part of our job is to be able to create that. To do that, I need to understand my ceramic materials that I'm using. I don't, I don't care which ones you use. I only care that you understand how to use them. So I'm looking for high fluorescence and I'm looking to use that on my substructure to help give me a little bit more light interaction. So again, this is the most challenging when we're doing single teeth or, or, or very small restorations. Um, we're gonna start with our photography, obviously, and the photography is very important for us to understand the value of what we're looking for. I don't wanna pretend like it gives you all the answers because it doesn't, but it definitely gives you a better gener uh, general path of the direction you're going. So for me, I always start with my value. I wanna confirm that value through my, my black and white or my gray out photos. And then I'm also gonna take a chroma photo of my shade series. Um, that's really critical for me with every case I do. And I don't care if it's single central or, or a full mouth rehab, I need some basic information about where the teeth belong in the face. When I do get into smaller restorations like single centrals or two unit cases or, or congenitally missing laterals, I can't survive anymore without polarized. So for those of you who aren't using it, this is one of the, the better technological tools that we have out there today. And this is a must for me with almost all single central or single unit kind of restorative cases that I can actually polarize the photograph and then be able to see a little bit differently. And I love showing the comparison between these two. I think as ceramists, we probably look at that tooth on the bottom and we think, wow, I can actually see a lot more of the depth and detail and opacity and translucency. And I can also tell where some of the banding is more surface oriented. So all those things really give me some ability to figure out my positioning of my ceramic material as I go through mm -hmm. the process. So uh, most of the doctors I work with at this point will take a good um, prep and temp photo series. I I'd like to just throw out there, I don't wanna go deviate too much because we don't have a lot of time, but. I know when I show a lot of these, uh, the reaction in a lot of technicians' minds right now goes to, well, my doctor doesn't do that, so I can't do this. And not to be cold, but that's a poor excuse because most of my doctors didn't either. I had to teach them, I had to push them. In order for me to do that, I had to become more educated to be able to push that process. So I try to throw out the blame game and I try to really work on the how can we get to where we wanna be? I don't want my time being spent figuring out what's wrong. I want my time figuring out how to make it right as the process goes on. And, and that's really an important part of the process for us. So quickly, let me just kind of explain to you how I look at color before we get into some of the other materials. Um, I break color down the way nature breaks it down. I look at the chromatic aspect and the cervical third. I look at value in the middle third, and I call the incisor ledge more about the age relationship with the tooth. Is it a younger tooth or an older tooth? Uh, and I think it's important that we could break down the teeth this way. I'm kind of a big fan of, the of not using the classic guide anymore. I think it's really outdated. So I, I highly encourage people to kind of work more in a 3D range. And the real reason I talk about that is because if you look at the classic guide, you're gonna notice it works from a system what I call chroma, which you see up here at the cervical, less chroma, less chroma, less chroma, less chroma into translucency. And that is not really how nature works. If you look more to the right of your screen and you see what nature actually is, nature really tends to work more from chroma value and then translucency. So that does make me shy away a little bit from some of the uh, multi-layer materials, although I do like them in some circumstances, I have to be careful because I'm not looking to just lower my chroma in the middle third. I'm actually looking to increase the chroma in my little third, middle third. And I'll show that to you in a second as I get into the uh, frameworks and designs. So I won't spend a lot of time with shade taking just because we don't really have it, um, but 
I do cover this a lot more in other courses and, and lectures and so forth. So for us right now, we'll take our basic shade photographs and you can see some polarized. Uh, I'm going to now think through my materials. Do I want zirconia? Do I want something uh, translucent or, or opacified? What's going to give me the best result here? I'm going to wind up picking something kind of in the middle. I don't want the most translucent, yet I don't want the most uh, opacified either because I'm going to take a little bit of the warmth from that teeth and then use that to help mask what's underneath there and then do my layering concept over it. The other thing that I'm always trying to do is simplify the layering concept. So what do I mean by that? Well, I think the substructure that I choose has a really big importance on how we actually make that work. And remember, in the end, what am I looking for? The patient's face in general, not just a zooming in on my work all the time. As important as that is, I want to study it and I want to understand it, but I also want to know how to get there. And that's where the product and process part comes into me. So we'll make our zirconia coping. I'll do my layering on it. Um, you can see my texture is a little weak on this one. I, I, I over polished it, so bad on me. But I think in general, the, the basic parts of the tooth is there, the color and the value and all the little things that we need. And it always kind of nice to check these under the polarized. So the polarized takes out all the surface topography and all the line angles and just gives you kind of the depth of the restoration. And I think that looks okay, it's pretty much on insert. And again, no matter what the restoration is, when there are smaller restorations, these are really challenging. So when you see a tooth like this, do I want a more opacified coping or do I want a more translucent coping? I definitely want something a little more opacified here so I can mask some of that underlying color and then create my ceramic layering on top of that. And that becomes more critical for me so I can really understand um, what I'm doing in my layering system to match the naturalness of the patient. Um, and you can see that worked out fairly well for, again, a single unit. And uh, some, the doctor did some fabulous composite work on the cusp, but that was uh, Dr. Savan Finkel. So it's really nice to be able to have that communication with your partners. But now when we get back into the laboratory, I need you to understand basic substructure design. Because as I go around the laboratories teaching these days, these days, I'm feeling like that's really missing. So I like to tell everybody that basically for me, the way this should always work is your substructures should support your light reflective index, how I want light to bounce or be absorbed or be reflected. But it also should be a baby version of what the substructure looks like or what the final tooth will look like. And for that, I want to really make high highlights and where I'm looking for light reflectance, light absorption, and support for my ceramic layering that I'm going to go through the process. So for us, for a long time, we did a lot of double scanning, where rather than designing in three-dimensional space, we were kind of just doing a little quick wax up and then double scanning it. We don't really do that so much anymore because the software has really gotten better and better and we've gotten more and more comfortable with the process, but I'm not afraid to do that, especially with abutments and, and, and certain implant cases if I need to, because like everything, there's a pro and a con. There's a pro and a con by hand building something and there's a pro and a con by machine building something. And we need to understand all the aspects of that so we can make what's best for the patient in the substructure and in the final restoration. So again, no matter what the frame is that I'm doing, I'm always looking to support my framework to make it proper for the light absorption of the restoration. Now, I know that seems a little funny when we talk about it this way, but I'm kind of getting to the point where my layering is getting better or, or easier, should I say, because we're utilizing our substructure materials, especially with zirconia these days, to do more for us. So the ability of our milling machines to actually give us more detail becomes really critical for me. Uh, and I think what's really important is I can actually use this zirconia materials, whether it's opacified or translucent, to help me in the design process, meaning that I can actually peek out certain areas that I want to be more reflective, especially if I'm using a more opacified material, or I could hollow out other areas to be more absorb, uh, absorbable so I can get more of a lower value look or more of a, a, a uh, an additive kind of translucency in the actual nature of the material. The other thing I want you all to be clear of with the zirconium materials that we use today, there's always a big debate on surface tension and, and do we sandblast or do we not sandblast? Um, 
I'm going to go against some of the manufacturers and tell you that I always lightly sandblast my zirconia. And I think that's a really important part of the process. I do understand that it does have some, it could have some detrimental issues. Uh, and I'll explain to you how I deal with that. But in the end, what I don't want to happen is I don't want to create a surface on the zirconia that rejects the other materials. I want to make sure I'm breaking the surface tension and I want a more flatter adaptive surface that whatever I lay on there, be it a liner or, or um, my basic ceramics or colorants, that I could utilize that material. So my process is the same. I'm going to get a roughened surface through sandblasting and then I'm going to run a conditioning program. I'm sure some of you are thinking that the science on the conditioning programs don't always prove out, and I would agree. There's not a 100% fact that by running these conditioning programs on your zirconia that everything is perfect. Uh, at the same time, I've been running them for about five or eight years now, and I'm going to knock on wood and tell you we predominantly have very good results. I'm not getting any cracking or chipping or anything happening to my zirconia restoration. So um, maybe it's superstition for me at this point but I do want to run these conditioning programs all the time, especially when I'm sandblasting the zirconia. Um, so you can see the difference between, the, you can see the difference between the two sides, the prep side, which become very um, highly surface tensioned and the other side that's been sandblasted. I always compare this by looking at a, a sheet of agate or a piece of glass. If you look how smooth it is, if I actually drop water on it, the water kind of beads up. But if I roughen the area and create a rougher surface as I drop the water on it, the water spreads out. And this is the way your ceramic works. We want to be able to, whatever we put on that zirconia structure, we want it to kind of sink in and get a much better um, mechanical bond as well as because you're not getting that much of the chemical bond. So I want to create as much as I possibly can. Let's talk a little bit about your framework design. And I think this is where the area that I think is biggest for, for us. Um, I can't tell you how many laboratories these days ask me to come in and do ceramic programs. And I always say, yes, I'd like to, but um, I, I need to do more than that. And they're always like, well, what do you mean? We just want you to do a ceramic course. And I'm like, well, I can't really fix the ceramics if we can't get the right design frames and substructures or the model and die work isn't correct or the communication part isn't there. There needs to be more to that, to that process. So this was actually a case that I actually did. It's not a real case. It's a, um, a case I did for a course in London a few months ago. Uh, but you can see the diagnostic wax up was done. And from that diagnostic wax up, I think Jennifer did that. She does a beautiful job on these wax ups. You can actually see that um, with, we're capturing all the information that we need, even the surface topography and actually the gingival architecture. It was a pink and white course that we did. So we were talking about pink and white ceramics. And then you're going to notice the cutback. And that cutback is designed specifically, especially for this particular course, where I left the laterals as almost monolithic. And I'm going to say almost monolithic in the sense that what they really are is they're micro layered. I'm just going to layer a very small amounts of ceramic on them. And I'm going to leave most of the structure in zirconia. Yet on the central two centrals, those are going to be fully layered. And we're going to use whatever we need, two, four, six, eight, 10 powders that we would normally use. Now the next part of this challenge though is I'm gonna to have to make this cutback transform into our zirconia material. And to do that, obviously I need some accuracy. So I said in the very beginning that I think the technology is great today. And I think what separates kind of the men from the boys in these scenarios is really about the little details. There's, there's not a machine out there, a scanner or a milling machine out there that cannot mill a coping that fits okay. I think that's kind of easy stuff today. But where the real challenge comes from me is, can I mill all that detail? Can I scan all that detail that's there and can it be milled as accurately as possible? And that's what our challenge is, is in the secondary milling components or the communication between our scanning and milling, is it there enough? And that's what we call that, that final carving process. So I think as you kind of look through the process here, um, basic milling is kind of easy today. And the grinding is even kind of easy. Where it really becomes important to me is that little definition uh, that's going to give me the differential and what I'm looking for, that kind of high definition. And I think I really find that works better in the, in the semi-closed systems. Or what I say by that is meaning a system that the scanner and the, and the milling are, are one part of the unit rather than having two different components with a middle 
um, interpreter in between there, I find that we get a little bit more detail out of these. So yes, I can actually scan that and we can get almost exactly that mill almost to perfection. I think we've made about 15 or 20 of those. And then the rest is easy, right? Now I'm gonna put a little bit of uh, liner materials with some color on there and I'll fire that and you can see how we get the warmth up around the gingival area. Then I'll start with my dentins and I'll go through my normal buildups and that stuff becomes you know, fairly simple. I'm not layering tons of powders anymore on them. I'll use some translucency and some effects and that's after one fire. So that's out of the oven. Those are the teeth that we use as kind of a reference point. So we did this in one fire in London actually a month or two ago. Um, from that out of the furnace, I'll take that down and I'll clean it up a little bit and just check the line angles and contour. But in the end, the goal is to be able to support what I saw in, in my wax up in my zirconia and transfer that into the final restoration. And again, these are minimal buildups. These are very small amount of powder buildups, especially on the, on the two laterals, which again, were almost micro layered. I probably only used about three powders on them. So they become very simple. And I think for a live course, you can see we were fairly close. I wouldn't say it's perfect, but we were, we were fairly close to what we were building up in someone else's kitchen. So what does this allow me to do by understanding my milling processes? Um, basically what it allows me to do is understand how to use my ceramic differently. What I used to spend a lot more time doing was spending a lot more time filling my space. So my space for full contour is usually about 1.2 to 1.5. And that's a lot of space to fill for ceramic materials, especially if you're using five, six, seven powders. So I would spend some of that time understanding where I wanted to create my chroma, which is always more in that cervical area that you see down here, where I wanted my value, which is always in that middle third, and where I wanted to get more of a translucent or age-related type tooth. And those become the kind of keys that I look for. Now I can make those way more complicated by using three or four or five more powders, but I can also make those less complicated by using my zirconia substructures to add into that process. So that, that designing part is critical. And that's why I started to say before when I'm doing these courses, it's almost impossible to do ceramic courses today without having your design team involved in it. Because this is the part of the process that really makes life easier for you in the ceramic layering process. So almost all the cases we do in zirconia today, and I wouldn't say we're perfect with this yet, but we're, we're getting better and better every day. You'll notice that we're building much more structure out of the zirconia itself. And we're doing this because we want some areas to be more light reflective. And we're actually using the zirconia base as part of the process for the ceramic layering. So now the dentin becomes a little bit simpler. I don't need as much dentin. I can go straight into my translucents or my enamels, whichever I'm gonna use. I'll do very little tiny cutbacks or just kind of breaking up so light can bounce off. You can see how light is working through the zirconia on the right of your screen, meaning that the zirconia is translucent enough that we're getting some light transmission. And also I'm choosing between my opacified ceramics or less opacified ceramics to create that look uh, where I want it to be more of a mammalon looking type structure. Obviously we cover that on animals and that becomes our bake and it be, kind of comes the same process for me over and over again, right? So I want to understand the marginal position, let me go back one. I want to understand that marginal position and my emergence profile. I want to understand where the incisal edge, and I also want to understand where the surface is going to be. So as I look close at these teeth, I want to understand looking at the natural tooth, where does the light reflect? Where does the light absorb? And if I could use that information in my scanning process, or in my uh, designing process, I should say, then it makes life a lot easier for me from a ceramic point of view. The ceramics almost become easy at that point. So I can use three, four or five powders, keep it much simpler. And again, be able to kind of make them all look somewhat the same. So here's again, a first bake. Um, this is a full contoured central, meaning it's a full buildup with 12 powders or however many I use. The lateral is almost monolithic. I'm just layering on the facial with only three, four powders. And the cuspid is actually a window veneer. So this was another course model from uh, a few weeks ago somewhere else. But again, the goal of this in the end is to kind of make all the restorations look very similar 
even though I have much different spaces to use and I'm utilizing my substructure to help me do that and my knowledge of the materials, whether it be the ceramics or not. So let me put this all together for you with one case. Um, for me, I started off by saying how important that understanding the patient and the face is. Uh, and that's where I start. So for me, everything starts in the incisal edge position. Where does that belong in the face? And once I understand that, the rest kind of becomes easy because then I really understand where the pink belongs or where the gingival architecture should be. And then I also start to understand what the maxillary plane should be. And then I could start to look at the incisal plane of the lower if I'm gonna do full mouth or just upper arches. So I'm kind of using this system all the time. I'm looking at the face. This patient is Ella, by the way. She was a case I did a, a bunch of years ago. Uh, and you can see in the face right away, looking at the eyes, it, it's a little challenging. She's not very happy with the smile. And we're gonna do a diagnostic wax up on this. Now, I think you all understand that this could be done digitally. This is one area that I don't do much uh, digitally. I, I, this I still like by hand. So in my lab, we have Helen and Jen and Abe and we all kind of wax. So it's a little um, more for us that we, we, we like having our hands on that. But I get it as I go around, a lot of people are doing kind of digital wax ups these days and they work fine. And, and obviously Aman has materials for that that work very well for you. Um, for me, I'm kind of comfortable still with the hand-on process for this. I don't think that'll change for us for a little while, <clears throat> at least in the diagnostic waxing phase. So we're going to utilize the horizontal plane, which is very typical for us. We want to make sure we understand where the incisal edge belongs and where the incisal plane belongs. And one of the great things about milling today is that I actually can see all this in my plane or in my in my scanning process. It's kind of funny. I remember about seven, eight years ago, I was in Australia, uh, Austria with Amon actually, and I was talking to one of the engineers about creating a level plane where they can use that plane in the scanning device. And I think they all looked at me as the kind of dopey American and said, oh, we don't need that. We have everything we need. And I was like, well, we don't. We should have that nice flat level plane in the articulator system. This way we always know where horizontal reference is. And I even made a, a sample of one and tried to show them and never really worked. And then about three years after that, I was lecturing in Chicago and that same engineer came up to me and went, ah, I got exactly what you mean. Now I understand it. And I think they've been able to incorporate a lot of those things into the software these days, which becomes very critical for us. So once we have that diagnostic phase and we know where the horizontal is, and again, this could be done either digitally or, or, or hand whacked, whichever way you choose, we'll tend to build what we call a little deprogrammer right into the wax up for these cases. And that again, can also be done digitally or can be copied digitally. So sometimes we'll scan these. I actually have more series on this case that I didn't put in just for time where we go through the whole PMMA process. We can actually scan this wax up now um, with my little deprogrammer on it. And I can actually mill out a shell provisionally that the doctor can prep and be able to place right in the mouth. And we have a whole sequence of how we apply that. So in the end, we're gonna take what we see in the face and the white and the pink. We're gonna incorporate that by doing an aesthetic evaluation, which is kind of very standard for us. And you can see the difference in the patient's eyes, just putting in an aesthetic evaluation, just putting an additive wax up into the patient's mouth. And it changes who she is and how she feels. And obviously that day she bought a full mouth rehab, which she didn't think twice about because that's who she wanted to be and that's how she felt. I think that was important for us to be able to emulate that we can repeat what we showed her. So we'll go into our diagnostic phase and this is all in the CAD work. These were actually 20, I think eight or six single units basically. And we're gonna make that design. And again, what am I looking for? I'm looking for the reflective areas of where I want the light or the absorbing areas of where I wanna absorb some of the light so I can get more translucency. And then we'll just layer our ceramic and that becomes kind of an easier process now. But remember, the ceramic layering is part of the process in the substructure. It can no longer just be about just being a coping designer or just being a ceramist. You need to be both these days. And I think this is why it's so important that we utilize the technology and really learn how to use it to our fullest advantage. So here's our final case for Ella. Um, this case has been in the mouth, oh God, it's gotta be about uh, five, maybe even six years now, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, it worked pretty well. And she's been very happy ever since. And it was a, an easy before after. I think those cases really kind of 
you know, speak for themselves in the sense of when you when you can really change how a patient feels about themselves. And let's remember that's what it's all about, right? In the end, product and process is great. The technology is amazing. The little details are what separates most of the machinery today, and those are the ones that. Uh, you really need to kind of look into, especially when you're investing in these processes. But for me, um, what I focus on the most is that human element or that human experience and being able to take the patient from the point of the before to the after or making them feel comfortable about themselves. I think this is what's going to really separate us uh, in the years to come. And as much as everybody wants to tell you that it's a race to the bottom with how fast and how cheap we can make a monolithic molar, I'm going to tell you it's the opposite. I think you need to be very good and efficient at that, but I also think you need to be a person who can work through the whole patient and understand the whole process. And as I travel around today, I will tell you that the labs that are the busiest are the ones that are kind of working in this vein. And the ones that are struggling, looking for more work or can't keep up with the cost of what they're doing are the ones that are just using technology just for the quick in and out of it. Uh, and that's not a long-term plan or a long-term strategy for me. So I hope when you see that um, the patient is really an important part, it sparks a little bit of you thinking that we need to be better, all of us. I know I do, and I know how I work with my doctors and my patients, and, and, and that process in between is great. And I love the companies and the machineries that I work with. I also want to make sure I know how to use them to their full extent, because that's what's really going to separate me when it comes to the final of with our, what we're doing with our patients. So with that said, I think I'm just about on my time. Let's see here. Yeah, look at that on the nose, 245. So um, I'll say thank you um, for listening. And uh, my first webinar in a long time. So I kind of, I guess I, I grew to start liking these after a while of doing them. Um, I think I have another one in December. And um, thank you all for joining in. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions.